Hello and welcome to the care and monitoring of central lines, chest tubes, and OGNG tubes. Our objectives cover some anatomy and physiology pertaining to central lines, the normal operation of central lines, and troubleshooting central lines. We will also go over chest tubes and the equipment associated with the chest tubes. Our objectives include the normal operation of chest tubes and troubleshooting common problems associated with them. Finally, we will go over orogastric and nasogastric tubes, the equipment needed, and troubleshooting them. Here we have a picture of a triple lumen central line in, in place on a patient. Central venous lines typically are inserted in the internal jugular or subclavian veins. The catheter tip enters directly into these large vessels. Central lines are utilized in patients requiring long-term IV therapy, in patients who have poor peripheral IV access, or in patients requiring large volumes of fluid. Dual lumen, triple lumen, and quad lumen lines can be used in patients. This allows for the administration of various medications simultaneously without the risk of inline medication compatibility issues. Some central lines are peripherally inserted central catheters, also known as PICK lines. A PICK line is essentially a narrow, flexible catheter inserted through a vein of the upper arm above the elbow until it, its tip reaches the superior vena cava. Central line kits generally look like this example and include a puncture needle, a guide wire, dilators, and then the actual central line. All the tunneled lines have a polyurethane terephthalate cuff, which helps in the tissue fibrosis to anchor the line to the tunnel and decrease infection risk. Central lines are an open pathway into major vessels leading directly to the heart. It is important to maintain sterile technique and always wash your hands before and after touching the lines. It is important to wear the correct PPE and to keep the insertion site and sterile dressing dry. If you are going to transport a patient with central lines in place, you should perform the following tasks. Determine which lines are actually being used and which medications they contain. You should flush the lines per the manufacturer's recommendation to ensure patency. The lines need to be flushed every 12 hours and after each use. When you are flushing the lines, clean the caps with alcohol swabs prior to using them and then again after each use. Flush with a 10 milliliters of normal saline or the amount directly printed on the device. Use a 10 cc syringe. This generates proper intralumen pressure for flushing. Adopt a push-pause technique when flushing. Some catheters are for saline only. When transporting a patient with a central line, you should alert the doctor immediately if there is any discharge, redness, swelling, or pain around the catheter insertion site. Don't allow the patients to baby their arm. Normal use increases the blood circulation to the arm. Never pull on the catheter and protect the lumen so they don't get caught on anything. Be sure to monitor your infusion rate. Dislodgement of central lines or pick lines can cause excessive bleeding. You need to hold direct pressure for 5 to 10 minutes to ensure the bleeding has stopped. When flushing central lines, you can use the mnemonic sash. Push saline to ensure the line is patent. Administer the medication. Flush it with saline to make sure all the medication gets into the vein. And then add heparin as an anticoagulant to keep the line from getting clogged up. Remember, some lines are saline only. Every time you flush the IV with normal saline or heparin, use the push and pause method. Push a little solution, then pause for one to two seconds then push a little more, and pause, and so on. This method cleans the inside of the catheter. As with all central lines, 10 milliliters is the minimum size of syringe that should be used with a pick line. Using a smaller syringe size can result in excessive pressure being exerted, which could result in damage to the catheter. Don't ever force a flush into a pick line or central line. Here are some of the complications of central lines. If there is an unexpected removal, treat it as an open wound and hold pressure with an occlusive dressing for 5 to 10 minutes. 
notify medical control of unexpected removal, and you can consult them on further orders. If a patient begins to experience shortness of breath, observe the patient for signs and symptoms of attention pneumothorax. They may have JVD and diminished lung sounds. Absent lung sounds and tracheal deviation are late signs. Pleural decompress the patient per local protocols. Other complications can include an air embolism, where air bubbles may enter the blood vessel during insertion of a PICC line and with its use. Proper infusion techniques are essential as the tip hovers above the right atrium. It is possible for an infection to develop either inside the vessel or the surrounding the insertion site where the catheter enters the vein. Phlebitis is the inflammation of the vein where the catheter is inserted. A thrombus can block the line if it hasn't been properly maintained and flushed regularly. Finally, nerve injury could have resulted from the insertion of the central line. Next, we will be talking about chest tubes. This picture shows a patient with a chest tube inserted and it has been sutured in. This site still needs to be covered with an occlusive dressing. A brief review of pulmonary anatomy and physiology helps you understand where the chest tubes are placed and how they work. Chest tubes aren't placed in the lungs, but the pleural space, a potential space rather than an actual space between the parietal and visceral pleura. The parietal, or outer pleura, covers the chest wall and diaphragm. It contains a small amount of serous fluid, about 50 milliliters, that coats the opposing surfaces allowing the visceral and parietal pleura to glide over each other without friction while enabling the pleural surface to adhere to each other. Think of two glass plates with a thin coating of water. When you place the second piece of glass atop the first, the two plates slide smoothly, but when you try and separate them, they stick together. These pictures show what a chest tube can do. The picture on the left has a patient with a right tension pneumothorax. You can see it pushing all the lungs and the heart to the left side of the patient. The picture on the right shows the tension pneumothorax has been relieved. Some conditions that can disrupt the pleural space include chylothorax, a milky white lymphatic fluid in the pleural space, empyema, a collection of pus caused by an infection. Hemopneumothorax, which is a mixture of air and blood in the pleural space. Chest tubes are used to treat conditions that disrupt the pleural space. The body can absorb a small amount of fluid or air over time. But large volumes limit lung expansion, cause respiratory distress. In extreme cases, a tension pneumothorax may develop. This condition occurs when the injured tissue forms a one-way valve or flap, enabling the air to enter the pleural space and preventing it from escaping naturally. Seen mainly with thoracic trauma and central line placement, this condition rapidly progresses to respiratory insufficiency, cardiovascular collapse, and ultimately death if unrecognized and untreated. It requires immediate life-saving treatment by pleural decompression followed by chest tube insertion. Chest tubes may also be used to prevent or mitigate postoperative complications. For example, after cardiac surgery or chest trauma, one or more chest tubes may be inserted into the mediastinum to drain blood and prevent cardiac tamponade. In addition, chest tubes can be used to instill fluids into the pleural space, such as chemotherapy drugs, or sclerosing agents to treat recurrent pleural effusions. This is a procedure called pleuridesis. Also, blood collected from the chest tubes may be used for autotransfusion. The overall goal of chest tube therapy is to promote lung re-expansion, restore adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and prevent complications. For treatment of pleural space disruptions, chest tube therapy should focus on three primary objectives. One, removing air and fluid as promptly as possible. Two, 
preventing drained air and fluid from returning to the pleural space. And three, restoring negative pressure within the pleural space to re-expand the lung. There are contraindications to chest tubes, which include refractory coagulopathy, a hernia involving the diaphragm, hepatic hydrothorax, and adhesions in the pleural space. Coagulopathy, also called clotting disorder and bleeding disorder, is a condition in which the blood's ability to clot is impaired. Hydrothorax is a condition that results from serous fluid accumulating in the pleural cavity. This specific condition can be related to cirrhosis with ascites in which the fluid leaks into the pleural cavity. Hepatic hydrothorax is often difficult to manage in end-stage liver failure and often fails to respond to therapy. Adhesions are the fibrous bands that form between tissues and organs, often as a result of injury during surgery. They may be thought of as internal scar tissue that connects tissues not normally connected. Some complications can include incorrect placement or kinking of the tube and rare complications like empyema or perforation of the internal organs. Pleural empyema, also known as pyothorax or purulent pleuritis, is an accumulation of pus in the pleural cavity that can develop when bacteria invade the pleural space, usually in the context of pneumonia. There are three stages, exudative, when there is an increase in pleural fluid with or without the presence of pus, fibrinopurulent, when fibrous septa form localized pockets of pus, and the final organizing stage, when there is scarring of the pleural membranes with a possible inability of the lung to expand. Simple pleural effusions occur in up to 40% of bacterial pneumonias. They are usually small and resolve with appropriate antibiotic therapy. If, however, an empyema develops, additional intervention is required. Re-expansion pulmonary edema is a rare complication resulting from rapid emptying of air or liquid from the pleural cavity performed by either thoracentesis or chest drainage. Despite being infrequent, mortality may occur in up to 20% of the cases and is attributed to the abrupt reduction in pleural pressure, especially as a result of extensive pneumothorax drainage or when there is a long-term pulmonary collapse. Other complications include compression of the right ventricle, perforating the mediastinum and causing a hemopneumothoraxes, bleeding from the vessels below each rib, and infection. Chest tubes come with and without trocars. Chest tubes can be placed using a trocar, which is a pointed metallic bar used to guide the tube in through the chest wall. This method is less popular due to an increased risk of lung injury. The Heimlich chest drain valve is a specifically designed flutter valve used to replace underwater bottles in chest drainage. It can be attached to a drainage bag or to a regulated intermittent sporadic suction that can be used to remove secretions. They may be preferred for simple pneumothorax during transport because they don't require water-filled containers. An integrated chest drainage unit, or CDU, is a variation of the old three-glass bottle system in which one bottle was used for collection, one for a water seal, and a third for suction. CDUs have a water seal chamber, a suction control chamber, and a collection chamber. A one-way valve prevents air and fluid from returning to the chest. Almost all newer systems are self-contained and provide everything needed for rapid setup and function. You'll need a vacuum gauge and tubing ready to apply suction to the CDU. Start by filling the water seal chamber to the level specified by the manufacturer, usually to the two centimeter mark. Next, fill the suction control chamber with sterile water to the 20 centimeters of water level, or as ordered. 
Keep in mind that the water level in this chamber determines the suction level, not the amount of vacuum applied from the vacuum gauge to create the negative pressure that draws air in and out of this pleural space. Connect the drain to the vacuum and slowly increase the suction until you see gentle bubbling in the suction control chamber. Excessive bubbling is loud. Besides disturbing the patient, it may cause rapid evaporation, which lowers the suction level. Monitor water levels, adding sterile water when necessary. You can gain useful information by assessing the water sealed chamber. As air leaves the chest, bubbling appears here, indicating an air leak. Also, the water level may reflect intrapulmonary dynamics. A slow, gradual rise over time indicates more negative pleural space pressure and signals healing. After chest tube insertion, connect the tube's distal end to the CVU. Secure the tube at the insertion site with sutures. Apply an occlusive, sterile petroleum gauze dressing around the tube. Then apply a dry, sterile split 4x4 dressing over everything. Secure all tube connections from the chest tube to the drainage container using either tape or zip ties. A post-insertion x-ray confirms tube position and lung expansion. At the top are water sealed drainage systems, pediatric on the left and adult on the right. Today's water sealed drainage systems are comprised of a one piece, three chamber setup, which provides separate functions of fluid collection, water seal, which serves as a simple one way valve and suction control. An easy way to describe the one way action of the water seal is to refer to a cup of water in a straw. If one were to blow air into the submerged straw, air would bubble out through the water. Now, if you wanted to draw the air back through the straw, you would only draw water. Hence, when chest drainage came into light many years ago, the one-way action of a water seal, water bottle and straw concept, provide a simple but ideal means for evacuating air and not allowing it to return to the patient. This chest drain seal system is a dry seal drainage system. These are controlled by a self-compensating regulator rather than a column of water. A dial is used to set the suction level. Unlike chest drains that utilize a traditional water seal for one-way one seal protection, this uses a dry seal valve as its seal. This mechanical one-way valve allows air to escape from the chest and prevents air from going back into the chest. The advantage of a dry seal valve is that it does not require water to operate it and is not position sensitive like a water seal. Other advantages of dry suction include higher suction pressures and easier setup, a quieter operation with no bubbling sound, and more constant pressure because no water is lost to evaporation. On the other hand, a mechanical dry seal valve does not provide the same level of patient diagnostics as a traditional calibrated water seal. Dry seal drains must rely on other means to provide diagnostic information, such as a separate air leak monitor for optional air leak detection, and a vacuum indicator to determine when vacuum is present in the collection chamber. A water seal is a simple one-way valve, which allows air to exit the chest and prevents air from returning to the patient under normal conditions. It's also a very useful diagnostic tool, as it can show even the smallest trends of an air leak, as well as changes in intrathoracic pressure. Assessing patient air leaks is easy with Atrium's blue tint water and air leak monitor. Continuous bubbling observed in the water seal will confirm a persistent air leak in either the patient's thoracic cavity or possible tube connections. Intermittent bubbling with gentle float ball oscillation will confirm the presence of an intermittent air leak and no bubbling with minimal float ball oscillation at the bottom of the water seal indicates that no air leak is present. Bubbling from right to left in the air leak monitor must be present to confirm an active air leak. The Ocean Graduated Air Leak Monitor allows visual detection of air leaks from a low volume of 1 to a larger air leak volume of 5. Air bubbles passing through the Graduated Air Leak Monitor help the clinician assess air leak patterns and patient air leak trends. Changes in intrathoracic pressure can be determined by observing the level of the blue tint water and float ball 
in the calibrated water seal column. Atrium's blue tint water and float ball make changes in patient pressure easy to monitor, even in low light conditions. When the system is connected to suction, patient intrathoracic pressure will equal the suction control setting plus the float ball water column level. For gravity drainage applications, patient pressure will equal the float ball water column level only. Each atrium ocean chest drain incorporates an advanced high negativity float valve, which is located at the top of the water seal chamber. During normal or deep inspiration, atrium's float valve will allow thoracic patients to draw as much intrathoracic pressure as they may require during each respiratory cycle. However, during prolonged periods of accumulating vacuum pressure, atrium's float valve will automatically lower high vacuum pressure down to a safer, more desirable level. Atrium's unique controlled release valve design safely and automatically protects your patients against prolonged exposure to excessive negative pressures, which can accumulate as a result of repeated patient tube milking or stripping. To manually lower the height of the water seal column when connected to suction, temporarily depress the manual vent located on top of the drain until the blue water column lowers to the desired level. It is not recommended to depress the manual vent when suction is not connected or not operating. When monitoring a patient's chest drainage system, it's important to periodically check the water seal's operation and fluid level. If the water seal is either underfilled or overfilled, it should be adjusted accordingly to the prescribed maximum 2 centimeter level. Using a 20 gauge needle with syringe, adjust the water level via the grommet located on the back of the water seal chamber. Here's just a quick look at a, of a chest tube insertion. A small incision is made, usually at mid-axillary line between the fourth and fifth ribs, on a line lateral to the nipple. Clamp dissects over the rib to avoid nerves and vessels beneath the rib. Clamp opens to spread the muscles. A finger is used to explore the space, avoiding the need for a sharp instrument. The clamp holds the chest tube and guides it into place. The first step in the placement of a chest tube is to identify the insertion site. The insertion site is the fifth intercostal space just anterior to the mid-axillary line on the affected side. This can be found by using the nipple level as a landmark for the fifth intercostal space. In females, always be aware that the nipple may be displaced inferiorly due to large pendulous breasts. In this case, Remember to stay above the inferior mammary fold where the nipple would normally lie. With the patient lying supine, position the hand up and over the ipsilateral shoulder and secure it in this position to keep it out of the surgical field. Surgically prep and drape the chest at the predetermined site of tube insertion. Using a small gauge needle, locally anesthetize the skin and subcutaneous tissue and the periosteum of the underlying rib. If possible, the pleura just past the rib should also be anesthetized. Make a two to three centimeter transverse incision parallel to the line of the ribs at the predetermined site with the number 11 scalpel. Bluntly dissect the subcutaneous tissue with the scissors or hemostat. Dissect over the top of the underlying rib until the next highest intercostal space is encountered. With the tip of the hemostat, puncture the parietal pleura while pushing just at the top border of the rib. You must always enter the pleural space over the top of the rib to avoid damaging the neurovascular bundle that lies along the groove at the inferior border of each rib. Be sure to enter the pleura in a controlled fashion to avoid lacerating the lung with the hemostat. Once inside the pleura, spread the hemostat widely and withdraw it while still open to create a sufficient opening in the pleura for the chest tube. Before inserting the chest tube, place your finger into the hole of the pleura. Move your finger around 360 degrees to confirm correct location in the pleural space by feeling the lung and making sure that there are no adhesions or impediments to placing the chest tube. A large chest tube, a number 36 or number 40 French, is used in trauma to allow for the evacuation of blood and clots. Clamp the proximal and distal ends of the tube before insertion. The distal clamp will keep any blood from rushing out before it can be connected to a collection chamber. The proximal clamp will assist in chest tube insertion, but may not always be necessary or helpful. 
Advance the chest tube into the pleural space to the desired length. All of the drainage holes should be well inside the chest cavity to provide a proper seal and prevent leakage. The chest tube should be positioned posteriorly and aimed superiorly in the chest cavity. This will allow for maximum drainage in the supine position. It may be possible to see fogging of the chest tube with expiration and it may be possible to listen for improved air movement on the affected side. Connect the end of the tube to an underwater seal apparatus collection chamber. Sizes range from 10 to 40 French, and the size required depends on the indication for the chest tube. In general, tube sizes can roughly follow the algorithm pneumothorax, pleural fusion, empyema, and hemothorax. Here are some general maintenance requirements for the chest tube care. You should get vital signs, note the drainage, check the occlusive dressing, and look for tidling, air leaks, and subcutaneous emphysema. Tidling indicates fluctuations in the water sealed chamber's fluid, fluid level that corresponds with respiration. On inspiration, increased negative pressure in the pleural cavity increases the water level. On expiration, Decreased pleural pressure decreases the water level. Shallow breathing causes less fluctuation and labored breathing causes more. If you find subcutaneous emphysema, correcting the position of the tube usually stops the leakage of air into tissues and the air is absorbed in a few days. If they make their way up to the neckline and face, assess the patient for intubation. You should always position the chest drainage system in an upright position, below the level of the patient's heart. The equipment you need to correct any problems include normal saline to refill the water seal, 4x4s, Vaseline gauze, and tape to reseal the wound occlusively, and non-tooth padded clamps for when you need to clamp the tube. In order to help re-expand the lung and assist with drainage, a patient may need to have to frequently breathe deeply, cough, and be re repositioned. You should change the dressings as appropriate, or immediately if they become soiled, saturated, or loose. A chest drain has rarely killed anyone because it was left unclamped. The same cannot be said for a clamp drain, which runs the risk of producing a tension pneumothorax. Even a drain which has not had an air leak can develop a tension pneumothorax on clamping. It may entrain air around it during inspiration, when the ribs open up. If clamped, that air cannot get out as the ribs clamp down during expiration. One of the few indications for clamping drains is during transfer of the patient either to or from a bed, during which it may be necessary to raise the drain above the level of the patient. Raising the drain risks siphoning the drain contents back into the pleural cavity. During transfer, one person should take the responsibility for the drain during transfer, and ideally the drain should be pinched temporarily, not clamped. No clamped drain should be left unsupervised, and drains should not be clamped during transport. Be aware that titling, fluctuations in the water sealed chamber with respiratory effort, is normal. The water level increases during spontaneous inspiration and decreases with expiration. However, with positive pressure mechanical ventilation, titling fluctuations are the opposite. The water level decreases during inspiration and increases during expiration. If titling doesn't occur, suspect the tubing is kinked or clamped, or a dependent tubing section has become filled with fluid. Also, don't expect titling with complete lung expansion or with medial stinal tubes, because respirations don't affect the tubes outside of the pleural space. Intermittent bubbling, corresponding to the respirations in the water seal chamber, indicates an air leak from the pleural space. It should resolve as the lung re-expands. If bubbling in the water seal chamber is continuous, suspect a leak in the system. To locate a leak source, such as a loose connection or from around the site, assess the system from an insertion site back to the CDU. When searching for the source of an air leak, 
used rubber tipped or padded clamps to momentarily clamp the tubing at various points. Bubbling stops when you clamp between the air leak and the water seal. If you've clamped along the tube's entire length and you still can't find the source, the CDU might be faulty. Replacement should be considered. If the chamber is bubbling while the suction is on, it indicates a large leak. If the suction is off and the chamber bubbles when the patient coughs, it's a small air leak. Studies show that drainage from the pleural space is impeded when tubing has a dependent loop. Ensure the tubing is straight or loosely coiled for optimal drainage. Drainage accumulating in the tubing will impede suction. If there is no way to position the tubing as described, physically lift the tubing and empty drainage into the device every 15 minutes or as it accumulates. If drainage abruptly slows or stops, the provider should suspect occlusion, perhaps by a clot. Newer tubing contains a non-thrombogenic coating to prevent clotting. Use a gentle squeeze and release motion to small segments to the tubing to help drainage move through. If drainage cannot be reestablished, consult with the doctor. If the tube moves, check to see if the holes are visible on the tube. If not, secure the tube with more tape and document it. If a hole is visible, notify medical control immediately. Do not reinsert the chest tube because this can introduce pathogens into the chest cavity. When patients get chest tubes, they are normally placed on suction with the CDU in place. Once there is no more fluid or blood leaking into the chest cavity, the patient is placed on a water seal. That is just the CDU without the suction running. If there are no leaks in 24 hours, they can remove the chest tube. While monitoring the patient, always verify tube placement on your documentation prior to departure and each time you move the patient. Make sure the chest tube is secure. A normally functioning chest tube should have air bubbling that fluctuates with respiration. Assess the color of drainage in the drainage tubing and collection chamber. Know that old drainage in the collection chamber may inaccurately reflect current drainage as shown in the tubing. At regular intervals, at least every eight hours, document the amount of drainage and its characteristics on the clinical flow sheet. Be sure to report sudden fluctuations or changes in chest tube output, especially a sudden increase from previous drainage, or changes in character, especially bright red blood or free-flowing red drainage, which could indicate a hemorrhage. Frequent position changes, coughing, and deep breathing help re-expand the lung and promote fluid drainage. Avoid aggressive chest tube manipulation, including stripping, or milking, because this can generate extreme negative pressures in the tube and does little to maintain chest tube patency. If you see visible clots, squeeze hand over hand along the tube and release the tube in between squeezes to help move the clots into the CDU. As a rule, avoid clamping the chest tube. Clamping prevents the escape of air or fluid, increasing the risk of tension pneumothorax. You can clamp the tube momentarily to replace the CDU if you need to locate the source of an air leak, but never clamp it when transporting the patient or for an extended period, unless ordered by a physician. In the event of chest tube disconnection with the contamination, you may submerge the tube one to two inches below the surface of a 250 milliliter bottle of sterile water or saline solution until a new CDU is set up. This establishes a water seal, allowing the air to escape and prevents air re-entry. Remember to monitor the insertion site for placement, subcutaneous emphysema, and secure connections. You may need to add fluid to the water seal chambers. Here are some common chest tube complications. You should watch for signs and symptoms of attention pneumothorax and treat immediately. 
Should the chest tube be removed, treat it as an open chest wound and seal it with an occlusive dressing. A chest tube is placed in a patient to restore the intrapleural pressure and allow re-expansion of the lung after a pneumothorax or hemothorax. While paramedics do not usually place chest tubes, they do transport patients with chest tubes in place and therefore will have to monitor the pleurivac system and troubleshoot problems. Assess the chest tube insertion site to ensure the tubing is still sutured in place securely and that the suture site is not infected. Document the insertion site and condition of skin, including absence of subcutaneous emphysema at the site. Assess the drainage system. Mark the volume and note color and consistency of the drainage. Currently, there's 180 cc's of blood going into the pleurovac at a slow rate. Up to 100 cc's an hour is normal. Excessive drainage should be brought to the attention of medical control. The second chamber creates a water seal, allowing air to escape the chest and not re-enter. The water in it should undulate or tidal with respiration due to pressure changes in the pleural space. The fluid level should rise on inspiration and fall during exhalation. If the fluid is not undulating, check for kinks in the tubing or that the system has accidentally tipped over or is no longer below the level of the chest. If the fluid in the middle chamber is bubbling, check for air leaks and repair or replace the system. The chamber furthest from the patient is usually attached to low wall suction of about 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Suction is at 10 centimeters. Gentle bubbling is desirable. Ensure suction is set at the ordered level and is not too high. Only padded hemostats or non-serrated clamps should be used and only momentarily when changing the system, checking for air leaks, or assessing the patient's tolerance for chest tube removal. Notify medical control of any need to change the system. There's proper blood drainage and there's no air leaks. Nasogastric and oral gastric tube care. The main purpose of placing a gastric tube is to remove air or other contents from the esophagus and stomach safely. They can also be used to administer meds and food. When measuring, measure the nasogastric tube from the corner of the nose to the angle of the jaw to the xiphoid process. The oral gastric tube is measured from the same, in the same fashion, except your starting point is the corner of the mouth. There are several types of gastric tubes. Here is the single lumen Levin tube. Here is a dual lumen Salem sump tube. Dual lumen nasogastric tubes are designed to suction fluid and air from the stomach without damaging the gastric mucosa. Most tubes have a valve placed on the end to protect from gastric contents. Here we have the Lopez enteral valve and the Prevent anti-reflux filter. Finally, we have x-rays of a poorly placed nasogastric tube that ended up in the lateral ventricle of the brain. Tuck your chin down. Chin down. Come on, chin man, down. you gotta go chin up. Way down. Way down. down. Chin down. Tuck your chin. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Nice. Right there. Okay, get it in there. Okay, you gotta don't push it hard. Me. Don't swallow. Just breathe out of your mouth. Hard. Here. Listen. Here. You gotta push go it hard. Let oh, let oh, me do it. <laughs> don't suck out. Okay, push it hard. Fast. Go. Ready, man? Fast. Plunge it. Okay. There you go. I'm gonna let you pull it out easy. Hammer it in there. So nice hard. and slow. Oh. Good. 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 <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I missed. Who pulled mine out? Did you pull it out? Yeah. yeah okay.